Welcome to another Thursday Night Live here with the Jewish Platform. Tonight, we have the privilege of having one of the most influential people in the Frum media circle. He's a business strategist, he's a current events commentator, and he's the co-founder of OJPAC, an organization that goes out there, you know something, why don't we hear a little bit more about it? From the co-founder. Everybody, let's welcome the one and only Yossi Gestetner. Yossi, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Um, nice introduction. So as you started out, I'm a uh, business strategist. That's my uh, main occupation. Uh, as a side job, if you will, I'm a commentator and a columnist on current events, U.S. current events, especially with a focus on politics and economics. And then I also co-founded OJPAC, the Orthodox Jewish Public Affairs Council, whose mission is to fight bigotry against Orthodox Jews and also to advocate for civil rights and civil liberties. Well, so money you don't make from being a current events commentator. Well, maybe you do, some paid gigs. And from a nonprofit organization, definitely don't make a lot of money. Um, the business strategist is where you make the money. And the others, I'm assuming, you do as a passion. So... Why don't we back up? What yeshiva did you go to? I attended uh, multiple yeshivas. Uh, okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, I mean, like, yeah. I started, okay. out, I started out in uh, Visions Monty. I was in Tosh for a while. Uh, then uh, my main yeshiva years were in Williamsburg, uh, Brooklyn, obviously. Um, and then when I left yeshiva, yeshiva, I took a GED, high school diploma. Um, at a later time, I took a uh, bachelor's degree in business administration with a focus uh, in marketing. Um, I think anyone who wants to run any department within a business needs to have the overall understanding of how a business runs, business administration, and then you can focus on a specific area that you like most. So, for example, the people who would take a... Uh, a business administration with a focus in, uh, let's say, production. If they want to run a, not a warehouse, but let's say a company that puts together cabinets and so forth, and you need to run an assembly line, that's uh, totally different information, at least once you pass a certain level, than someone who wants to focus on marketing, which is more about the public image of the company, the customer service. Um, marketing in our circles is Gavad Hashem a coil, as they would say, for anyone who does graphic design. Graphic design is not marketing. Graphic design is a function within marketing. Uh, a good marketer will have, will have an understanding of the strategy of the business, the funding of the business, the profit margins of the business, and I like to focus a lot on, on the money part as part of the marketing review. Um, a marketer would even help help you figure out what to charge for something because that's part of the marketing um, but that's 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 an important part of the business but I think every every function in the business is good I think if, if someone has a large business um, and doesn't have an outside perspective from someone who has an understanding about human resources HR they, they will probably be uh, spending too much money on employees potentially have too many employees on board uh, it's not about uh, um, cutting corners. It's about having the right mahalach, how many employees to have. But obviously, marketing is one of the early things in a business because if your business doesn't stand out, um, essentially, if you don't know what you want, then nobody else will have a clue. And frankly, if you look at many ads sometimes, you open it and you have no idea what the person wants. And just because, uh, you know, before Rosh Hashanah, you have an ad, Vihonik, trapped from the, from the apple, nobody's going to remember you because everyone does it. Um, Moshe, that's why we didn't do it, right? Huh? That's why we didn't do it yeah, before Rosh Hashanah, yeah. right. Yeah. So, well, so, you know, it's not, it's, not a problem. it's not a problem to have an ad before a holiday season. But just to have another run-of-the-mill ad is a waste of your money. By the way, for my clients... I always encourage them not to run ads in these uh, Paisach editions and the Sikhist editions. We always place the ads right after Yom Tov. When everyone else is out of money, nobody's advertising, the publications are very thin, and then your ad, your ad stands they apart. Stick out, right. And then at that point, people are, are probably bored. You know, after, <coughs> after Paisach, from before Peter and Bismarck, Paisach is a little bit hectic. 
uh, except if you sell a Paisa product. So, you know, marketing isn't about this, uh, this type of graphics or that type of graphics. It's understanding uh, what it is you serve, whom you serve, what's your specialty, how you stand apart, and to get that message across. Oh, I understand. So, you, you, you call yourself a business strategist more than someone that does marketing. By the way, nine out of my ten friends probably do marketing or are in the marketing industry. So you're saying that there's marketing and then there's marketing. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm not trying to to bash anyone <coughs> or or the music to machen from anyone who is in a specific industry, but um, you know. A lot of times, when, when people have a meeting with a marketer, put it this way, they will not finish the meeting because they think it's going to cost a lot of money. But sometimes, a marketing conversation, a marketing strategy session is not about going out there and spending a lot of money on ads. It's about having a better understanding what it is you sell <coughs> so that your sales team has the right text when they pick up a phone. And what exactly is that? That's a process of working out the messaging. It doesn't involve any money. It doesn't involve any money. So, mm -hmm. so it's it, it's it's possible that you have a lot of people in your circles who do marketing. Just as somebody who is in leasing will think that everyone is in leasing. Uh, the reason why I call it uh, as business strategist is in order to get to a marketing phase of the business, you need to have a better understanding of the business. Before that, you need you need to have a, a bigger strategy. strategy. And besides, because I'm a marketer. And I focus on messaging. <coughs> if I would call myself a business consultant, come on, what a business consultant? You're just a clown. No. Business strategist sells better. Sounds better. And that's a and that's a marketing line. And and I admit it. I don't I don't I don't hide it. Um, and this is this is exactly what I'm saying in terms of marketing. Your messaging your messaging needs to be well. You need to uh, you know a lot of times people reach out to me and they want to set up a meeting in four weeks. I, what do you mean four weeks? I, I'm available tomorrow. Available tomorrow? How are you available tomorrow? Because I don't have five meetings a day. It's impossible to process five meetings a day. I have a lot of office work. So if you want to have a meeting tomorrow at two o'clock, most of the time it can be available. I'll do. I'll do. I'll move around my work, and that's where I try to stand apart from other marketers. Is to have this quick turnaround time for a meeting. Uh, is to look at the business in general without necessarily uh, going to a place where you need to spend money on production and ads. Not production as in this thing. <laughs> yeah, but, but let me ask you like this. I understand you're a business strategist. You did end up on but how you, you're you're famous not for being a business strategist. You're famous for your current events commentary, and more so as the Nemsich Of from Heimish Oilem with the, the OJ or, Pack, the organizational work. Yeah, right. The PR. So so here's my question: How did a book from Vizhnitz and Tosh, and I'm not sure what yeshiva you were in Williamsburg. Veen. How did a book from over there become passionate about current events? Okay, today's days, everybody's passionate in politics. But how did you become passionate and, and defending the from Oilam? How does a book from a real Hasidish yeshiva go into politics, current events, and something like OJ Pat? So it's a it, it's a combination of it's a combination of a few things. First of all, uh, both my parents were interested in politics. Okay, it wasn't necessarily a conversation, no games in their home, but they were interested in politics, especially my father. Um, secondly, my upbringing wasn't so rosy. I'm not saying that everyone has an easy upbringing. I had a very difficult upbringing in some ways, especially where I felt that I don't have a goyle adam. Again, my parents did the, did the best that they uh, you know, were able to do at the time, but when you come from a large family, a poor background, and parents who were divorced when I was very young, I started out very young, I was you know, on defense a lot. Um, so therefore, I needed to stick up for myself in order to get through the day. Again, possible many other people had the same challenge or even worse challenges. So I, I grew up having these two things, uh, a, a father very interested in U.S. politics, a uh, mother very interested in talk show hosts like Bob Grant going way back, um, and then just having the difficulty of feeling that I'm a, a Nirdev. Again, I had a, a, a great um, 
friendships and Haider, um, great Magichirim um, and Manahalam, they were all very nice to me, but that's, it's still a factor. So, you know, those, those two things, I think, have put me on a track of being, you know, so opinionated, interested in politics, and being on offense when someone wants to attack your way of life. Um, my mother, Leia Shulam, which passed, uh, you know, she passed a couple of years ago, she also liked numbers a lot. She liked num and, and I'm known as someone who likes numbers a lot. Um, and again, going back to the marketing, one of the things that we always pull up, that needs to be calculated at the table, and I can show you a book, I should have brought it, it's all about the numbers. What's the earnings? How are things better? How are things different? Where did you spend the money? What's your profit margin? If you are the distributor that needs to distribute money, the, the company that produces the product, how much money they're putting into the marketing? What's their profit margin? If you don't have the money, how are you, how are you going to pay for it? Um, what does it take for you as a company to be seen? Let's say you have a product that you're selling in the Monty Monterey area. What does it take to be seen uh, and to be seen on a steady basis? So you give a person a number and they start flipping out. Oh, what, I'm going to spend now, let's say, twelve, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars $2,000 a week for a half a year, a year? Oh, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money? Okay, let's stop. Let's reverse engineer it. How many families, Orthodox families, live in Rockland County? 14,000. How many live in Kirisur? More than 5,000. What's the average family size in the Hasidic community? Five and a half people. Okay, so how many items do you need to sell per week in order just to break even after production costs? This amount, that amount. So I'm asking you, if you were to have an ad in the months of you in the Community Connections and two ads in Monroe, and you don't need to change your ad every other week because we go through the process on, on messaging that the, the ad can run continuously without needing to change it. Because if it was good this week, it's going to be good in six weeks from now. If it's not going to be good in six weeks, it doesn't work now either. So the person then sees the number says, you know what, even if everything, if all else fails, I would, it's reasonable to, to expect that among 19,000 households, let's say 1,000 households a week would buy this, uh, would generate this amount of money, this amount of, uh, you know, gross profit. So, all right, so then spending 1,000, 1,200, 1,500, 2,000 a week doesn't sound so scary. Um, so that's, that's basically the, the way the Yossi Gestetner came about. Right, because I know that in all the times that you're trying to defend our community, it's always in a game about numbers. You bring up X amount of COVID cases or X amount of anti-Semitic cases and stuff like that. I see that a lot with you. But let's back up just a little bit. So, you came out of yeshiva, you got your GED, you went for a bachelor's degree, you started, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you started marketing right away, at what point did you, there's a big difference between current events commentator, I'm saying, in a class of 30 boys, you can have 25 of them that are current events commentators, um, but when did OJ Pack start? Okay, so the, so the sequence of events are as follows. I'm now 35 years old. It started basically 20 years ago. Uh, at 15? Yes. Uh, it was at the 2000th election. The fight Bush between and Bush and Gore in Florida. Okay? I was so raw in politics that I thought a day after the president wins the election, he goes into the White House. And that was me at age 15. I, I didn't have a clue. But... Um, we started having an interest in politics at the time. So that's where my interest in politics, beyond what I saw at home, started. Um, a short while later, I started sending letters to the editor in Yiddish publications, English, even non-Jewish, and most of the time it would be published. I got a stick of fader in the hand. It would be published. Um, then and, and at a passion... Sticking up for the underdog. No, no, no. At that, kind of no at, that time, at that time, it was only about politics. It was only about bias in the media. It was about politics, current there events. There was bias in the media back all, all 20 the years time. ago? It's very simple. It's because people, are, people have a bias in themselves. It's not always a hateful bias. People have a perspective. You have a perspective about me, which is a bias. Maybe it's a good bias, but it's a bias. You're not a robot. So... I would send letters to the editor, and it would, it would be published, it would get published. Um, a while later, uh, I submitted an article for publication in one of the Yiddish publications about the Beast. The Beast is the presidential limo. 
and it was a cover story. And this was before Zman was out. Yes. Right. This, uh, but the Shteir. It, it, was, it was in the Shteir. Oh, it was in the Shteir. It was in the Shteir. It was on the cover of the Shteir. The, the owner at the time was Shimon Litsky. And he, he was a close friend with one of my family members. And the family member told him, Yossi knows how to write. He's going to write up something for you. Take it. He took it. Obviously, he needed to do a lot of work. But that's where it started. A while later, I started writing for the one second, let, let me cut you off for one second. You were a bocher. The internet was just starting. I'm saying Google is 20 years old, right? Yeah. So 20 years ago, or whatever amount of years no, back... No, it it this wasn't 20 years ago. This was less. But okay, 2004 or five. But where, where did you get all of that information on the beast and, and on everything else you were picking up? How did you get that? Uh, it depends. It depends which time. First of all, I used to, I used to read a lot of newspapers. Um, Not just the Lech but I'm yeah, saying... Correct. Read, yeah, correct. Lech wasn't around at the time. So I, I would I would read I would read newspapers. Um, we would have books at home. Uh, I did have access to the internet, controlled access to the internet when I wanted to follow follow up on the news after nine eleven. So, you know, the internet uh, fifteen twenty years ago what, what was quite accessible. Uh, so the first article was to write the article about the beast for the Stern. and then a while later I started uh, writing for the Blood. Um, again, a current events article. And this is basically where things took off. At the time, uh, going back 15 years or so, there were elections in Rockland County, in Muncie. And word got out to people who are busy with elections that this, this Yossi kid, this Gestetner kid, a hot of in the hunt. He knows how to make good arguments about current events. You know, he should be, he should be uh, approached to, to, to write some stuff. So I would sit in at meetings and come how, up. How old were you then? I was at that point. I was twenty because it was two thousand and five. So at that point, I would sit. I would sit in meetings and come up with talking points, which people say, "Oh, it's talking points." Yeah, it's a point that you 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 know. I, I actually changed it. I coined it uh, fact points because talking points has a negative connotation. I called it uh, uh, talking points, uh, fact points. See, I'm so busy spinning. I don't even know where I am. Um, friends started calling me Doctor Spin. Forget it. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so I basically started writing fact points and, uh, for, for campaigns over time. Now, I, now those fact points were for certain candidates that you were trying to push or those fact points were for, no, again, it wasn't, it wasn't people you, to you, question. No, no, no. You, you, it was just about is there, there's elections going on, uh, in the town of Ramapo and the village of Spring Valley and points needed to get across in pamphlets, in articles, in ads. All, again, all of that, when you want to write uh, a website, a pamphlet, a mailer, uh, you want to produce a video, everything needs to be rooted in a core message. Right. You then funnel everything in the right direction, the right wording. But you need to have a core messaging. What points are you going to use today to get people animated about the election? And a lot, of, a lot of things that are used in elections throughout New York, the Hamish Oil and now as a default, are stuff that I was, I was among those who, who created those, those uh, you know, to get, people, to get people to vote. So, and over time, I, writing those stuff moved also into writing for, again, companies, lines. Um, and while I did that, I was still a columnist. For, uh, for the blood. The blood. So, I I started having a steady platform to write to write current events in the blood on a weekly basis, um, and I also started having business as a content writer about Nishkan Gantz Megillas. It's about you know someone makes a point to to hit back and to frame it in the right direction, um, which is two thousand five, six, seven, and eight. In late oh seven, I started talking on Komavasa. The political section of Komavas and the business section of Komavas is something that continues until today, Right, and I which, think I did some research. Which, uh, I no. think you're the most. I think that you're the or one of the most listened to shows on Komavas, according to the research that I did. I appreciate hearing that because again, it's it's good to know numbers. I'm not aware of that, but I'm I'm essentially a daily commentator for 13 years already. Uh, already right, 13 years is a monumental thing. It's not. It's not just a weekly columnist. It's almost daily, reporting political news and then having a separate section where you give monologues about current events. That builds a base, which is another important thing 
about marketing. It's about the steadiness of something. If you do something continuously and steady, if you will make sure, Moshe uh, Shehere too, if you will make sure to have live events every Thursday, no matter what, winter, zimmer, regen, schnei, busy season, slow season, Mamish, there's no such a thing, I'm busy now. You're busy now, have someone else take care of the cameras. Uh, fire, you know, you should get fired or have someone else on your device. There needs to be a continuous thing. If you would do that continuously, not a week, two weeks, or a, month, a couple of months at a minimum, over time, people will start saying, you know what, I need to go to the Jewish platform live Thursday. Maybe I'm going to see it Thursday night, Friday in the summer, in the summer Shabbosim or the Matzah Shabbos. It's the steadiness, and most people do not have patience for the steadiness. The, you know, Mazuk, that, uh, you know, Overnight success usually has 15 years of work behind it. Right. Okay. Um, I am blessed, Baruch Hashem, to, to go to events, to speak at events, and I, I, I ask to get paid a reasonable amount. Some people need to work a whole week to get paid what I charge for speaking at an event, a live auction or a fundraiser event. But it's not the two hours that it takes me now to go to the event and speak. It's the 15 years of work in the Seattle Deshmaya of being continuous, continuously focused um, where you start schnab the pirates. Most people don't have patience for it. Um, and that certainly doesn't work. I have to see what to do next week because next week I am going to be on a ski trip in Colorado. So we're going to figure something out for next week. Okay, Thursday. good. So, so we even, can go live in Colorado. No, you, you, there's, there are many things you can do. You can try to pre-record something if you did earlier. Okay, that's, that's one thing. You can try to have some sort of a hookup an interview with someone and the interview can be shorter can be shorter or again just or he should have someone else much should have someone else do the interview i think that we should poll our audiences and ask them do they want a live i'm, I'm not going with my family i'm going there with my yeshiva so we could either do a live with the yeshiva or we could have Moishi bring in a different guest and i'm assuming that we're going to hear from the audience what they would prefer so now so so let me let so we so right. we're continuing so um, you were saying that over, you over had the, so, 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 so at, at this point, seven, eight, nine, ten, I had a steady column in the blood. Um, I had a steady audience on Komovasa, so on a, on a daily and a weekly basis. Um, in private practice, I was focused in, in, in the wording, but I used to get, I started getting involved more and more in the bigger picture of marketing. So instead of just focusing on writing, I, I started getting pulled in more and more. One of the areas where I was pulled in to is because I followed the news so much, is reading, uh, you know, what people would call a mainstream publication, right? So when I would see an article there where I thought, you know, it's unfair to Orthodox Jews, I would reach out to the editor, I'd pick up a phone, I'd call and say, I don't understand, it doesn't make sense, it does. And a lot of editors would actually be engaging. Uh, I remember in 2009 there was a big bust. I think like 43 people were arrested. And CBS News at the time reported that 43 people were arrested, including 15 rabbis. I was on the, on the Palisades, 4 or 3 or 5 or 3 in the afternoon, when they went over to the local news. 15, rab 15 rabbis were arrested? What are they talking about? Um, so I called the station. I called the station. It was a 2009, Blackberry time, so I was able to pull up the number. And the news desk, hi, my name is Yossi Gistet, and you just reported the story that 15 rabbis were arrested. It's not just, there is no such a thing. Just because someone is orthodox and has a beard doesn't make them a rabbi. Okay, but that's not enough. I sent a text to people asking them to reach out to the station respectfully and express your displeasure. A friend of mine made a call, and he, he told me that the editor said, yeah, 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 we know about it, we're going to change it. And at the next report, it there's no, there was no mention about rabbis or Jews. How is it even relevant? How, how, is it, how is the ethnicity of someone relevant in such a news story? That's precisely what racism is. That's, that's, that's bigotry. Racism is, 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 is against a specific race. Bigotry is just hating a specific group of people. So, at the time, in 9 and 10 and so forth, I used to do it, you know, on the, on the fly. But then when I started seeing that it's not just... Okay, it's someone covers something. Cast the fragment, who cares? Who cares how someone in the media would cover you? The answer is very simple. When people are dehumanized, when people are de 
delegitimize, it causes a lot of problems. First of all, you have the Chil Hashem. But if you want to say Chil Hashem doesn't bother you, there's also the chances of anti-Semitism, whether it's attacks in the street, whether it's abuses by local governments regarding yeshivas, parks, uh, the Eidav, um zoning. And people can also face bigotry in business, where people would not service you well, where people wouldn't want to meet you, where people would cancel... And this happened during the second surge in October, October 2020, where people had medical appointments canceled by providers because they were from the supposed red zones that Coma created. So bigotry in rhetoric isn't just, okay, who cares? It actually has consequences. And this is exactly why all ethnic communities and all large racial communities, African American, Latinos, and Muslims have these organizations. It's not about yelling at everyone against the Semite, racist, and bigot. This isn't the point. It's about getting information, facts, and statistics out there for the reporters and editors who want to have an honest and balanced report. And it's also at times to hold people accountable for how they cover things and how they speak about things. And the fact of the matter is that in the past, uh, it used to be very normal every time a Hasidic person was arrested, it had a connotation rabbi. Uh, now, Baruch Hashem, we have a situation where a lot of times uh, people who are Orthodox or Hasidic and their ethnicity isn't even mentioned. So that's, so in 2009, 10, 11, you know, I used, I, I did this all on the fly here and there, but in, in early 2013, uh, we start, we, we incorporated as an organization, OJPAC, the Orthodox Jewish Public Affairs Council, which is OJPAC.org. Org, and I guess now we'll take a break. That's what Moishi signaled. While Moishi keeps yeah. on signaling, yes. Yeah. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we are going to be back to hear a lot more about Yossi, OJ Pack, and everything else that Yossi does. I'll see you in a minute. Hello, the Free Stuff Exfendu. Okay, Yossi, Burch Hashem, we're having a gewaldige conversation over here. You're smiling, we're having a good time. Now, generally, when we pull up a picture of you, it'll look something like this. Or something like this. And when we pull up videos, they usually look a little bit like this scientifically that where we stand now is oh so bad infectious but right down there is perfect it doesn't even make sense or like this talking about Jews and you want to talk about money that's a nasty way of talking or like that and number two don't show up after the attack you can stay home and send out your part of the statement as they would call it which is not meat and not uh, dairy somewhere in the middle you can keep uh, you know you can tweet that statement but year-round, when you run around all through these sweet, cute events, I want to see you in this community. Now, Buruch Hashem, we are having a very nice civil conversation over here. You're extremely passionate about defending the Frim Oilam, and it's beautiful. The question that many people have is, does it help? We know the famous Gemur, Allah Chabidiyah, Isaac Son of Yaakov. So what are you trying to do over here? You're going to scream anti-Semites. The Goyim are always going to hate us. Tell me about that a little bit. Does it help? Does it not help? Chil Hashem, do we care? They're supposed to hate us anyway. Let's go into that area a little bit. Um, I think there's a lot to unpack. First of all, most of the time when I speak to the media, it's usually during some sort of a crisis, right? Whether it's after the stabbing in Muncie, after Jersey City a couple of weeks earlier, uh, uh, anti-Semitic attack, um, a government official just popping off and creating controversy. 
So people, you know, a point that you made at the beginning of the, of the conversation that people don't know me as a business strategist. Yeah, that's by design, that my public persona and public image and public focus is as a commentator and as an advocate for the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, and that's why this, is, this has become my brand. Now, within the brand, I speak during times of crisis most of the time. So it's a, it's a, you know, it becomes a serious situation. Also, a lot of times reporters, reporters argue with me, so the the environment becomes heated, and a lot of times they do it because they want to trigger me for the perfect uh, soundbite, which is fine. Uh, a reporter told me a couple of months ago, "You're a soundbite machine," you know, which is which is fine. I don't. Um, so that's give me an example. The, example of what? Why? Why? why I when would, when somebody would trigger you, and why they would want to trigger you for a soundbite? Is because if 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 my response is is like calm and fashlukum, it sometimes does not underscore the seriousness of the situation. Right. So uh, so if they can get me going, um, I get more animated, and sometimes I can like unload six points in twenty seconds, and they would run with that because I get my point across. And it's you're passionate and about it's it. You're real it's about it. It's despicable for the county executive, to, you know, to, uh, to speak this way. A lot of times we do, we do, um, we need to redo it. So it's not. It's I didn't not, realize that on live news you have that option to no, redo. No, it's not always live. Most of the time it's recorded. And at this point, a lot of reporters in the in the New York regional market, we we have a mutually respectful relationship. They don't try to trip me up. But they try sometimes to, you know, be the devil's advocate, and uh, so they want to get a certain perspective, right? Your typical reporter is not within the Orthodox community, and a lot of them have a generally different perspective on things. So it's a stressful situation. Uh, usually, when I would speak to them, it's not stressful to me. It's just I'm good talking about I would be naturally worked up because it's it's. I mean, back in October, chalamoitzat, yom tzikasat. Every day, Governor Cuomo of New York made coronavirus about Orthodox well, Jews. Right. It's, it's absolutely insane. The numbers were not there to, to back it. He carved out blocks here and there to generate a higher infection number than had he looked at a whole neighborhood, a whole zip code, and then kept on pointing fingers at Jews. So I was, I was animated on a steady basis. So Why do you think he did that? Uh, it's what I said at the time. I think he he released a book mid October, uh, the leadership in coronavirus, right. whatever the name is, and the second wave was around the corner. The second wave was going to hit everywhere and everyone. So he was trying to deflect from the problem. So it's easy to take a couple of communities and make them and make them the problem rather than to the face the fact that this is coming back. And what happened was, before Rosh Hashuna, a lot of people within this community started testing because they wanted to know if they could go to shul for Rosh Hashuna and Kippur. So, not all, so when more people test, you know what happens? More cases emerge. And who went to test? You didn't have some sort of standardized computerized system to test every, you know, 10 out of 100 people. Who, who, who went to test? People, people who had symptoms. Sick, right. So obviously you would have more cases and you would have a higher percentage, a higher infection rate. So I was out there making this argument, and he didn't want to listen. And you think so, he picked the Jewish community because they're an easy target? I think many people do that. Absolutely, absolutely. The, Governor Cuomo, I don't, I don't think him as a hater. I think if you take his whole ten years in office, I think he's been great, uh, and De Blasio too. But I do think that it's an easy target. It's easy for the governor to yell at Orthodox Jews Why? in ways. In, why? Uh, why? Why easier than the Latino community or the African American community? It's because because I think most other uh, minority communities have long established entities who take care of these things. If you dare to speak a certain way, a ton of bricks will head your way, figuratively speaking. Okay, and my smile disappeared. I'm now I'm getting animated and worked up. That's exactly. I tried I'm, to trick you. Yeah, so that's good. You do doing a good job. Um, and then also, there are people within the Jewish community that anti-Orthodox bigotry is somehow okay. So anti-Semitism, some abstract 
anti-Semitism from unknown troll somewhere in the southern states at the end of the world. But picking on Orthodox Jews, yeah, it's their own fault. If, if you're ultra-Orthodox or you're a Hasidic, oh, oh, so or that's, oh, so that's, so that's it's even, not anti-Semitism. That's, that's, it's not, not, that's, even, that, that's another level of chutzpah where many people outside the Jewish community have figured this out. They figured out that if they can uh, drive a divide, drive a wedge between the Jewish community overall versus the Orthodox community, and within the Orthodox community, the observant Jewish community versus the ultra-Orthodox, which I understand. What do you mean ultra What's ultra-Orthodox? It's Orthodox Jews. If someone is less Orthodox in practice than uh, Hasidim or you and Moshi, I guess you can call them modern Orthodox. What's this term ultra-Orthodox? Like hardliners in Israel. It's all negative connotations to legitimize um, negative coverage, to legitimize uneven uh, enforcement from the government. Yeah, I saw I saw lots of that, and I continue seeing. It's it's not the Jews, it's the Hasidim, it's it's not the Orthodox so, Jews. So, it's yeah, the so, so 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 going back, so it it was a it was a stressful time, and obviously we were busy looking up the numbers. And the fact is that many zip codes, you had many counties in upstate, whole counties having worse infection rates than these carved out. Uh, neighborhoods within the Jewish community. Um, and the government was basically trying to deflect from a problem. And we kept on yeah, pushing. He needed a he needed, he, he needed a deflection, you know, they, to say, oh, it's only a local issue. And we kept on saying, no, it's not a local issue. Look at, look at Western New York, which uh, uh, borders Pennsylvania. Rates were going up because Pennsylvania was going to hell, basically, at the time. Um, so stop focusing because you're just painting a, a target on the backs of Orthodox Jews. And you are giving people of New York a false hope that it's only a problem of those Jews. And as the weeks went by, cases started rising everywhere, infection rates started going up, and all, all of the United States is in bad shape. All over the world. All over the world. And the, the, the second wave was a predictable thing. They were saying multiple times that in October, in November, there will be a second wave. So rather than taking the early days of the second wave and reinforcing whatever measures you think work, he, he lost a couple of weeks by focusing on Orthodox Jews, and that's despicable. And that's the reason why uh, I appear so, you know, so often angry and animated, because these things literally bother me. Maybe uh, I need therapy, I don't know, but it bothers <laughs> me. No, that's, that's a great thing. Now, back to the original question. Do you think it works? There's the, oh, there are so, going to be so people that always argue. So you are so 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 right. so so you, you, repeating a line. You're repeating a line that, that, uh, basically, a non-Jew by default hates a Jew. It, it's not so clear cut as you, as you put it. It's not a default situation where, where every non-Jew or even most non-Jews go around hating Jews. Um, it's, it's a, it's. It's a line. It's a line that can be uh, described at the time between Yankov and Isov without necessarily uh, having a full meaning in today's generation or later generations. Um, I think it's more a general, a general reflection of how humans are. Humans in general. People may want to pretend otherwise, but humans in general are more known and more comfortable, are, are more comfortable within a community that they know. And if it's the other, people start having uh, conspiracies, doubts, concerns. And this happened in every generation in the United States. Um, the Irish had this issue 100, year, 100 years ago. And today, there are people who live in the United States for multiple generations, and they have opinions about the newcomers, about the, the others. It's just humans are predisposition to have a bias towards or against different things. That's how humans are predispos predispositions. Now, is that an educational issue? Is that a comfort? Is it the unknown? Is it, it can be a man many things, but that's one of the reasons why there needs to be reasonable coverage about a community. Because if uh, every problem in, a in, 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 in Ocean County, in Rockland County, in Brooklyn, in Sullivan is is blamed on Orthodox Jews, and everything about Orthodox Jews is generalized and generalized as a negativity, it only increases the, the natural instincts for people to have biases one way or the other only gets inflamed. 
and when that gets inflamed, it leads to action, whether it's anti-Semitic attacks, whether it's people abusing the power in private business or in government, and therefore the work needs to, needs to be done. And it's not about yelling at people anti-Semite, if, uh, at a person anti-Semite. If you were to um, check the Twitter account of Ojapak, I don't think we ever called someone anti-Semite. We would use the term, it's bigoted, rather than calling the person a bigot. So not only do we try to avoid anti-Semite, we have to go we use the term bigotry, and rather than saying the person you is are a, big, a you are a bigot, which sometimes we would do that, it's bigoted. I don't like to I don't like to you know um, write off people, and there are people who in the past were very unfair to Orthodox Jews, people in government who have come around because again I think a lot of their own upbringing and their own uh, misunderstanding. Uh, about Orthodox Jews have led them to get their biases inflamed. Right. So we have people that have never and, seen and a Jew before. Yeah. It's not. It's not. A, it's not just people. It's not. It's not the typical old school anti-Semitism. It's a lot of bigotry against Orthodox Jews because at the end of the day, uh, Orthodox Jews are dressed differently than people in the rest of society. Orthodox Jews stand out. It's a fact. It's not and a, they're mysterious. It's not a it's a whole conversation. It's not I don't I don't I don't buy that premise. It's not it's not uh, how how are African Americans or Latinos more or less mysterious than, than Orthodox Jews? There are just more uh, there are just more Latinos out there than African Americans, so maybe more people interact. Whereas Orthodox Jews right, we keep, Orthodox Jews we keep to ourselves uh, very much. So that again that's another line that I what do you mean we keep to ourselves? Like ninety five percent people in the United States marry uh, within their own ethnic group. I lived on a block where there were a couple of churches, an African-American church and a Latino church. Wh why not mix it up? Because the fact is people tend to gravitate towards people who have been brought up and the same thinking. It's not about hating someone else. It's about that's, that's a certain way of life, a certain custom, certain uh, you know, heritage that people want to preserve. And if, and, and if you bring in someone from the outside, so to speak, you need to start it anew. So, right, but unlike, so unlike but, but 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 here's the thing, Orthodox Jews are seen in the tri-state area, right. and we are seen much more than we are communicated to, or than we communicate to others. So if you were to stop at a gas station, the Palisades, you would probably find the Orthodox Jew, or you know, any time you go there. Now, how many people who pass the Palisades at the same time and stop actually have some sort of communication? I don't know. They see people walking in. Long, um, long suits, it's another thing, black coats. No, it's not a black coat. It's a suit. It's a long suit, okay? So it's a jacket. That's the, you know, if you want to say it's a jacket, it's a long jacket. It's not a black coat. This isn't black, and it's, it isn't a coat. So, but they do see people with beards, pious, the side locks, head covering. Uh, okay, they look. So when there's a story about those people that they have seen at the gas station and haven't communicated, people are going to read it, you know? People, people will be jumpy to it. And that's the danger by not holding people in media accountable or not being available for comment and not getting the information out there. It takes the, the you know, you use the line, you use the line, Isis Sonas Yankov, right? A, a generalization that a non-Jew would tend to hate a Jew, which again, as I said before, that line isn't so clear cut as, you know, eye for eye. People say, well, I mean, eye, eye for eye isn't eye for eye in the, in the literal term. But even if it is, the level of hate can go up and down based on factors. How people, how people uh, act on the hate can go up or down based on factors. And by the way, what did Yankov do to Isa? Doiren Tvele Mochuma. He prayed. He tried outreach, being nice. And he was ready to land a punch if needed. The line is basically an analysis of the situation. It's not a checkmate. Uh, it happens I'm, to not, you. I'm not smiling anymore. Right, yeah. What you were saying is very true. I live, I'm the only eat on my block. I live in Howell, New Jersey. With my neighbors, I get along extremely well. Extremely well. We schmooze all the time. And we really, really get along very well. When we had a kid last year, we had a baby. All of my neighbors came over to bring gifts. It's the people two blocks away. They're the ones, oh, the Jewish family over here. So that's very interesting. Now, so, so, that, so that's what I'm saying. People have an internal bias. It's how far the bias goes and how dangerous it becomes that needs to be addressed. And people need to continuously work to understand and feel and know the neighbor next door. Perfect. Now, the big question, 
does it help? Of course. The I'm work that you do. It's sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it works. It helps sooner. Sometimes later. Sometimes at a larger scale. Sometimes at a smaller scale. Um, there have been, for example, uh, if you go to uh, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago you had, first of all, the, 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 the example that I gave you before. It used to be very normal that any time a Hasidic person was in the news, it was with the title yeah. rabbi. Those days are essentially gone. Many reporters have grown up and have come to understand that this is a crazy way to covering people. Many reporters wouldn't even mention the ethnicity of Orthodox Jews in the headline. Some still do it. But many don't do it. So th th there, there are so many media reports today, especially TV in the New York and the Jersey area, would not air if they haven't first gone out there to get a statement from someone in the, com in the community. Is that so? Wow. Th absolutely. If you ch Channel 2, CBS, NBC4, Fox 5, ABC7, uh, Channel 12 in, in New Jersey, all the time they would reach out to myself, to other people, to institutional people, give me a perspective. Give me some. Give me something a comment, and by by you being on camera for twenty seconds, it hap it helps a couple of, a couple of ways. First of all, you speak with the reporter before that, so the reporter gets a different perspective or a, 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 a bird's eye view, if you will, of the situation. And then every second that you that they give you on camera to give your perspective or the fact or to express your outrage, is another second less for someone else to make accusations against you. Well. Now, I had that in the beginning of COVID. I put out a video yeah, I saw that, around yeah. Lakewood. And I had many TV channels call me up if they could air that video. Yeah. And of course, I gave permission. But more than that, the local newspaper, the APP, uh, Asbury, were, Park Asbury Press. Park Press, they were always very anti. And I became friendly with the reporter because of that story, the one that reached out to me. He came down to my house a number of times to interview me. And... He went down to other. He so that's, I took so, him to so, other so, people. So exactly. So, so that's what I'm saying. So the Asbury Park Press used to be much worse. We took them to town a couple of times, and we reached out to shareholders. Asbury Park Press is owned by Gannett. We got all the way to shareholders, to 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 executives. We didn't fool around by just you know calling and you want to correct one, two, or three. At some point, at some point, you, you just you need to stop. Right. And I always tell a reporter, you know. They tell me, well, it's a story involving the Orthodox Jewish community. I said, it's fine. You need to have your self-test. You know what the self-test self is? If this were not Orthodox Jews, if this were Muslims, how would you cover it? If this were African Americans or Latinos, you make your decision. I'm not going to hold the bat for you. I'm not going to be calling you, you know, expressing frustration. You ask yourself, how would you cover it when, when it is someone from any other community? Wow. Well. And I'm assuming both through your own amazing work and through OJ Pack, you've somehow both with the with the authorities, local police departments. I know that you're involved, and with press and with many other people, Buddha Hashem, you managed to get a foothold in. Where I don't know if you have a say. I don't know how how far your influence reaches, but at least where it comes to publicizing things about the from community, people definitely think twice. Largely, because yeah, correct. So, so, so this this goes back to your question. If it helped, there, there there are monumental changes now compared to five and ten years ago, and a lot of times these things, because they are handled well, because so many editors and reporters reach out to get a full picture. Sometimes stories don't run because uh, oh, okay, so those are the facts. Can you prove it? Yeah, okay. So you know, we're not even bothering. Well, wow. because they literally would think one way about a story because someone would try to animate them into something, you know, to, into doing something. Now, in terms of policy, myself and people involved in OJPAC, we have uh, what they would call, a, you know, a generation ago, a Rolodex of people in multiple levels of government who we reach out to. And one of the, the malas that I have, Baruch Hashem, which some people hate but many people like, is they know where they stand with me. I would reach out. I wouldn't beat around the bush. I would pick up a phone. I would send an email. This is a problem. This is not fair. This is bias. This is not even handed. This will be taken to court. This will be taken to a department above you that can investigate it. It needs to be fair. And people are communicative, uh, are com communicate. Most people in government, most people in law enforcement, most people in media don't wake up every day. How can I go out there and punch a Jew? That's not how they get up. But a lot of times <clears throat> it becomes easy to pick on someone. 
like what Como did by like what Como did, right? or or as it was a situation a couple of years ago, um, during Purim, two children dressed in two Hasidic children dressed in blackface. Dressing in blackface is very intense. It's it's it's, it's it shouldn't happen, but when it does happen, how does that suddenly become a story for a regional TV channel? Do they have a story every time when it comes to uh, Halloween, every crazy way someone dresses and would say, you know, here you have two white kids dressing that way. It's crazy. In other words, even if, it w even if it is a bad situation such as here, not everything needs to become a story and it wouldn't become a story if it were two white kids living a half a mile up and doing it on a different holiday. And, and I remember, I remember a reporter reached out to me because someone took a photo of two children dressing this way. It wasn't even a current photo, it was an old photo, regurgitated every Purim, tried to smear Orthodox Jews. And I wrote to the reporter, let's do some math. In the New York and New Jersey area, there are a million people at least celebrating Purim. So I'm asking you, are you going now to torpedo this holiday for a million people who celebrate this because two children did something insensitive and wrong? Tell me. The reporter wrote to me, you're right, I'll take a pass. And to be honest, the the kids themselves probably wouldn't know what's wrong with that. It's not, this, is, this isn't the point because, you know, a lot of times people come with this argument, a lot of times people come with this argument, uh, you know, don't they have a point? So the answer is no. People do not have a point to pick on a whole community because of the wrongdoing of something, of someone or a few people. Why? Because then you're creating a situation or a standard where 100% of the people, 100% of the time, need to behave 100% perfect, or else all hell breaks loose. That's a crazy standard. How do I know it's a crazy standard? Because if 100% of the people, 100% of the time, behave 100% perfect, you wouldn't need prisons or prosecutors or investigators or, 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 or police officers. And I don't think, they all, I don't think all of them in the tri-state area are out there to take care of those badly behaved Orthodox Jews. And so, so humans do not, by, you can't, doesn't matter the amount of education, the amount of warning, the amount of restraints you want to be, it, there's always some reason why someone does something crazy or insensitive. And if you want to generalize it on a whole way of life, when uh, it's not rooted in the way of life, it's unfair and dangerous. And I, I, at times I also see this, I don't know if within the community or people slightly outside of the community, if Loyalani, there's an overdose or a suicide, these things are extremely weird and uh, extremely rare. And I happen to uh, work in the field, so I know the numbers. But as soon as something like that happens, right away, the whole community, and, and the truth is the whole community is responsible, but all of a sudden, the system is wrong, it's terrible, there isn't enough outreach, there isn't enough inreach, there aren't enough programs. So, so here's the thing. Um, in Sullivan County, there's a Facebook page, a large Facebook page, where they're on a daily basis busy about those Hasidics. You have people dying, you have people in Sullivan without a job, okay? Uh, children dying from overdoses. Things are very bad in many portions of Sullivan. Yet the main, fo main problem is when Hasidim move upstate for the summer, when so many people living in Sullivan would tell you privately, that they cover the bills year round because those Hasidics show up for three months. Yet they're busy, a lot of people, not they, everyone living there, people on the group, busy Hasidim this, Hasidics that. It's amazing. One day, a woman wrote an article, a post saying, you know, I was given a job to go to a private school, to a yeshiva. I was, I was given a job. I was given a job to go to a private school, to a yeshiva to take them on a trip. And I was very concerned, you know, reading up. She's new to Sullivan, and she's every morning, sits probably with a mug of coffee, and, you know, getting worked up about those Jews. No, not Jews. I'm not an anti-Semite, just the Hasidics. Just, right. Right? And she was very nervous. She writes, they showed up, they greeted her, they behaved orderly on the bus, and didn't leave, didn't leave any dirt. And therefore, she's asking the other members of the group 
stop bashing Orthodox Jews because many of you have it wrong. You know what the first comment was? People in cults are known to behave perfect because they're very constrained. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? If Hasidim behave bad, those Hasidim behave bad. If Hasidim behave well, yeah, of course, they're in a cult, they're in a, a, a strict environment. So sad. The point is, what I said before, it's not about the action. It's not because then you're setting up a standard where 100% of people, 100% of the time, need to behave 100% perfect. And that's a messaging thing, like 100, 103 times, right? Going back to messaging. Right. And that's that's an impossible standard See, to it's live called by. Not, not the rule of thirds, the rule of repetition. No, something with three. Not the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is in camera angles, but I don't know. We need it but, now. But yeah. precise. So it's not about it's not about it's not about it's it, it's not about if someone did something it didn't do because if you come from a position where you want to attack and you want to generalize and want to blame, then anything less than a hundred percent perfection will be used. As a reason to attack, right? So, um, so, so I didn't even get involved in the detail of the argument because it's not about the argument; it's about the argument behind the argument. Like I tell people, I don't like politics; I like the politics of it. No, the for science real. of politics. No, right. no, no. I, I like the politics, the politics of politics. politics. Like, like you know, if, if if someone is gonna make an argument, let's say, do we need to build a wall or not to build a wall? I'm not coming from a position. Yes, we need the wall. I'm gonna take your argument and hold you. I'm gonna take your logic and try to turn it on its head. If you're going to build a wall or not, I don't know. You know? <laughs> right. Um, we're going to do a quick commercial break, and then there are two more topics that I want to hear from you that are extremely important. Um, we're going to be back in one second, right after this commercial break. Hello, the Free Stuff Exendu. Okay, now Yossi, something, originally I wasn't going to ask you this, but I believe that you're the right person that I could ask this to. We're almost a year into COVID. The carbonus from Claudius Roll were huge. I know my grandfather passed away right after Pesach. We thought, now of course, our Koma Shemayim. We thought we have organizations. We thought that we have um, Askunim. We thought that we have people in hospitals. But the fact is that A, everything shut down. I mean, we couldn't speak to my grandfather or anything for three weeks before he passed away, and he was conscious most of the time. Um, the second thing is there was a huge amount of gross negligence. We believe, at least, that there was a huge amount of gross negligence in the hospitals. But more than that, there was definitely huge bias against the from community in hospitals, and it didn't cause inconveniences. It caused... I don't have the numbers, but of course, many, many, many deaths. Why did that happen? How did that happen? And what could we do? The chas v'shulim, such as things shouldn't recur. Um, we could cut to another commercial no, break. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm actually... I'm actually glad that you brought this up because it's very painful to me. Um, Baruch Hashem, you know, nobody close to me as an immediate family member passed from from coronavirus, but I can't describe to you the amount of pain and frustration that came in my direction of people at a loss, 
of family members in the hospital being neglected either out of neglect or out of panic and you know literally th there's no one to talk to um, the, the 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 reason being, you know, you ask the question, there's so many organizations and so many things, you know, why didn't certain things happen? And the answer is, as a, during, you know, at a time of crisis, everything gets messed up. So, so many of the things that you have lined up that work in Schulenzeit and Friedenzeit just won't work. You need to, you need to have... Uh, let's say from zero to hundred, you need to you need to run at hundred. The cylinders need to run at hundred in order to generate as if you're at level twenty. So that's that's the first thing. The other thing is a liaison to a hospital works for the hospital. It's a community relations job for the hospital. I'm not suggesting at all that any liaison to the hospital put the interest or the public image of the hospital um, second to the care of Orthodox Jews. I think during the height of the crisis, the first time around, between Hatsula, Hebrew Kedisha, the next, the third pillar, were the people in the hospital. But many of them are just volunteers for the hospital. Others get paid something from the hospital. When a hospital CEO says no, and it's not going to happen, or then what? He goes to bed? He can try. But he is wired, he's held back, he's on a leash. When I picked up a phone to certain CEOs of hospitals, the phone picks up, yeah, Yossi, what can I do for you? I don't run any type of organization that I need anything from the hospital that I'm going to think I'm not going to say it, I'm not going to push. So expressing Yiddish, you're going to talk to me and with me because I'm trying to bring to you concerns of a community in pain. Most institutions, so first of all, the liaison, the hands are tied or it's impossible for them to process so many concerns. Then... You need, during a Shas Mulchumma, you know, it, it, you need to have such a level of power to have this level of influence. The third thing is, most institutions, not most, many institutions within the community are very interconnected with government. Again, not as a conspiracy, not bad, because it's you and your brother and your family that are benefiting. But if you run an organization, which you run a local social, social services organization, and you need to make sure that you get grants, not because you're going to get an extra $10,000, because you really want to help your community, how, how are you going to take Bill de Blasio to task for something? Or Como? You can't do it. There's one entity that can do it. It's OJPAC. Our effort moved from just fighting bigotry to advocating for civil rights and civil liberties. Our mission has officially changed because we noticed suddenly, wow, there's, there is a gap where there's, there is no institution out there that can pick up a call over here and here. Let me tell you something what happened with the hospitals. The hospitals were closed in New York. And people reached out continuously to Governor Cuomo's office. Nothing moved. Literally nothing moved. And I reached out to donors and told them, listen, the way government works is with public communication. You need to get your message out there. It's not because government it tries to hide from something. Again, it's not a conspiracy. It just takes someone like Governor Como. He runs a state, 20 million people. Things are turned upside down. There are so many regions and businesses and interests and concerns being pushed to his office. Things will start falling off. You know, things won't even get to his third circle of people, certainly not the second, and certainly not his direct aides. You need to break that through. How do you do that? You do that the way Chamber of Commerce do it, unions do it, you know? What that is? It's 
the public noise. You need to get your story into the media. You need to get your story in an ad on TV. We raised money, tens of tens of thousands of dollars. We created, we created a TV ad, which we cut it for TV. It ran in specific media markets. You know what happened? This issue was suddenly elevated to the top of the agenda in the governor's office. Because, again, it's not some sort of a secret plan. Not everything that people happens in government is, is just how it functions. So, so much noise. So much noise. They can't hear everything. So you, you need to say somebody, yeah, somebody has this complaint. You, yeah. Right. If you are asking that has a speed dial, that and that person, you know what? There are many other people who have that. It's like people want to do email marketing. Email marketing is easy. Everyone can do it. How about sending out a mailer, a print mailer? Oh, that costs more money. How about getting on the phone to potential clients or old clients once in six to 12 weeks? That takes more effort. Same thing when it comes to policy. If you want policy to change, you need outreach, the lobbying and the advocacy is just one leg. You need to get the petitions going. You need to get the media stories. You need to get the TV ads. And we did that. And you know what happened? It hastened the announcement of the governor to have a pilot program where there will be visits in 14 hospitals. But the pilot program was only for two weeks, and then it went to sleep. You know what we did? We created a new ad, thanking the governor for his work, but asking for more. I was informed that this ad was seen by relevant people, and that they're aware that it's a concern, that they're aware it's a concern, and visitation to all hospitals were open. Was OJPAC the only entity to, to, to do work? No. And, and, and I'll admit to you, our media and ads efforts without the personal outreach of Olda Askunum wouldn't have made it, made it happen. The outreach efforts by Olda Askunum without those ads didn't make it happen. In other words, they didn't. So it's therefore important to have, <clears throat> to have an institution that is not involved in... in arranging grants or funds, not because it's a bad, th th those organizations are doing a bad thing. It's a different function. You need someone, no holds barred, no strings attached, that can push an important civil rights, civil liberties issue. He's not afraid of burning not, a bridge. Yeah, no, in fact, and again, I don't go around burning bridges. I'm going to burn a bridge, but you know what? I have a reputation, literally, in, 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 from Trenton to Albany, to City Hall, all over the place, Yossi is going to tell you whatever he thinks is the situation. He's not, not going to tell you something because tomorrow he needs something else. Tomorrow I'll worry about And it's not just, wow, Yossi, oh, he's so righteous, he's so amazing. No, it's about filling a specific gap in advocacy in our schooners that this community uh, has been missing. And you know, the hospital thing helped everyone. It wasn't, it wasn't about helping. It wasn't the Jewish. It, it wasn't Jewish. Uh, you know, I've seen, uh, you've seen from both ads, it has, doesn't mention Jewish. The only thing is, our, at the end, we needed to put, to put our disclaimer that we are running it as a nonprofit. Well, so for the future, I mean, hopefully Mashiach is going to come real soon, and hopefully we should never have anything like this again. But for the future, when the front community could be the entire world, we all felt completely powerless, and all those channels that were used to going down, they were completely shut down. And people that really did have power in hospitals, we know many stories. I'm not going to mention any specifically. Some of them are personal, some of them not. We know people that were really powerful within hospitals or within certain influential places that were just thrown out like dogs. So... For the future, I'll call to the Shalai Tuvoy. I'll call, uh, listen, I'll call to the Shalai Tuvoy, Dustin Ospalov Zam, and uh, have flashlights in case the lights go out, you know. But um, what COVID has shown everyone is that in Shah Smokhoma, things get bad and there's no way to prepare. But it has also shown that you need to operate on level 100. I have relationships with what people would call union bosses, the big union bosses here in New York. A lot of them know me on a first name, cell phone basis. And it's not about all I know. It's about when there's an issue comes up, such as in the hospitals, nurses have concerns. Hospital associations have concerns. How many people do you know who spend time and resources to build those relationships to keep those lines open? Not many. I'm not blaming anyone. I'm just saying... 
every every effective policy organization for a specific industry group a trade group will have these breakfasts and these dinners and these lunch and these pamphlets and these mailers all these things will year round and why because when when the moment hits they are running at 100 and they can therefore produce for the members at 25 generally speaking we are operating at 25 and the problem is again not to blame i'm, I'm bringing to the forefront a, an issue a lot of people a lot of people when they spend money they want to they spend a dollar they want to get three in return a lot of people don't understand the value of shlach lach mocho panayim oem. Go out there, go to a political fundraiser, go to a press conference, go to a rally, uh, host a breakfast. Why? People should know you. You should know people. And and a lot of people, I don't understand. What, what, there isn't a crisis now. David, if the crisis hit, it's too late. It's too late. Well, we had a policy conference last February because February is the anniversary even when we were founded and we wanted to have one this year, but with these COVID restrictions, it's not going to happen. We had a policy conference where we brought together donors to the organizations, people in Jewish community media, and movers and shakers within the community. Why is that? It's because those three pillars make OJPAC strong. And when it makes OJPAC stronger, it helps the community is when an issue comes up and we need to reach out to people in Jewish community, press and media, they're going to listen because you have spoken to them face to face. They, 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 they built, it's a good, a great networking event. Donors want to be there because they want to see, you know, how their money makes things happen. People who are in relevant and influential uh, community organizations in New York, New Jersey, Hasidic Orthodox or otherwise, they want to, they, they, want to, they want to meet donors. They want to meet people who are businessmen. They want to meet people who have influence through the channels of media. And, and, and those type of events cost a lot of money and people don't see the relevance of it right away. And let me, let me finish with this. After the stabbing in, in Rockland County, in, in, in Muncie, we kept on pushing continuously the problem that having a couple of police officers to go around the block two times is not enough. There needs to be done more. You know what happened? One of the senator's offices here in New York, New York State, reached out to us that there are nonprofit security grants sitting on the sidelines that FEMA didn't put out yet. Please get the word out in your community that this is how they can apply, and we will push FEMA to release more funds. And they released a million dollars more in grants that can be used to reinforce doors, cameras, and securities. These things work. Wow. No, was that? Many times, I don't know why you're jumping, but many times it takes time to work or niche I regard with this. By the so way, it says, when it says, it doesn't say you're going to find it as schmecken, frisch, and git. It doesn't say you're going to find it as soggy piece of bread, but it's still bread. Let me ask you, is that why I see I have two phones over here? Can the camera even see them? Um, is the flip phone over here that that's to the direct line to all the movers and shakers that you know, or nothing? No, to let do? me let me let me let me just uh, let me just show you something. I thought you were gonna call Como now. No, 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 I'm not calling. I'm not. I'm not calling. I, I just want to tell you, repo. I used to write reporter this and that, but decided instead of putting in a, at every name reporter, I just put repo. You can count. You want to count? Wow. Start, no, no, I'm going to press. Okay, Start one, here. Two, one, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thir
you know, a lot of times people ask me, you see, I see the, these ads for these networking events. Do you think, do you think those, those uh, networking events are good? Depends what you do there. If you go there without, uh, you know, you go there to eat uh, ruglach, I don't think it's going to be productive. If you go there to eat ruglach, but you have palm cards, you're onto something. If you go there, you have palm cards, but the messaging is a mess, it's not so good as if the messaging is good. If you go there with good palm cards where the messaging are good, and you hand it out to people, then you're a step ahead. After handing it out, and you don't take cards from people, you're losing out. If you take the cards and just have a nice bundle on your desk without picking up a phone in the following weeks, you're losing out again. So are networking event good? events good? Depends what you do. But I know that networking itself, to keep up with everybody, and to everything that itself is really difficult, and I'm assuming that is why, Buddha Hashem, you are so successful at what you do with OJ Pack. It's it, it, listen, the, the the policy event and the policy event that we had last year. It's not a cheap thing. We wanted to do one this year. We'll see if we we'll need to skip it all together or a couple of months down the line. We'll see how things work out. We actually want to expand uh, the next policy event, where people of all levels in government can show up and mingle with relevant people of this organization of this community. Um, because those relationships are good. Those relationships are important. Um, it's an investment. And I, and I wish, uh, you know, more people saw the value in it. Um, again, I'm not blaming anyone for anything. Kind of keep me chishgunish. And so I feel, you know, there's so many charitable causes in the community. You know, some uh, a donor, a very, very wealthy donor, told me, Yossi, your organization is a, is a level B. You know, I have people who I need to help them with surgeries. That's a level A. His name is Yoli. So, Yoli, do you understand that we helped open hospitals for thousands of people? Do you understand how many choylem we help, helped? Oh, I didn't know that. I can't blame him. So, I need to do more. I, on, I didn't know that before. Of course not. So I, need to, so, I need to do more on the PR too. So, for that, you need more funds and more time. We, we haven't spent yet money on PR. We, we never put out an ad... You can see a lot of organizations have ads to explain what they do. We haven't we done that. Did. We haven't done that in the eight years that we were around. But it's something that we need to do, not to promote ourselves. It's to strengthen the organization to generate more contacts, relationships, relevance, and funds to be more effective. But I believe that your face is one of the most common in media, and people know you for OJ Pack. And I'm assuming that. By the way, uh, Lou Young from CBS wrote in 2011 on Twitter. And we're gonna pull it up. Twenty eleven, two thousand eleven, almost uh, ten years ago. You have you have uh, the best groom pair to ever appear on TV. <laughs> Can we see that tweet? Yeah. Where she put it on, please. See here, you have it. In twenty eleven, you have the best groom pair. See, read it first. <laughs> I love this. I love this. What do you think? And I'm assuming that OJ Pack is completely funded by donations. Yeah, it's a nonprofit. It's a five one c three. It's a nonprofit. We have, we, we have done a lot of work through volunteers, uh, uh, people who help the organization. But at some point, you, you, you hit a limit. So we started pushing for more, more funds in, in 2020, and that, that will appear in our public filings later in 2021. Well, now we, we ran out of time. We thought it was going to be a short one. We ran out of time. We only have two questions that I was able to take from our Instagram. Thank you, everybody that um, sent them in. Moshi managed to slip them to me in the middle of the... Um... So we have two questions, right? One's a little bit deeper, and one is a little bit more fast kashmak. The one that's a little bit deeper is... I'm going to put it into my own words over here. We just switched over administrations from Trump, the right-wing administration, to the Biden administration. I'm not going to ask you totally about... The question over here is, which administration do you think was easier to work with? But I want to know, I'm going to take this question, I'm going to take it a step deeper. From what side do you find more hostility towards the from world? Is it the right wing, the Trump style administration, or is it the left wing? So, so the, the, to have this question in the context of an administration, I think, is, is not, the right way, not the right way to look at it. Because I think Joe Biden as a senator had a very friendly relationship with people in the Orthodox community. But here's a fact. The agitation against um, 
religion and Orthodox Jews or Jews in general over Israel, on the right side would be from the fringe, whereas on the left it would be much more institutional. It's a big difference. I'm not saying which is better or worse, it's just a different type of animal. The sad fact is that some people in the you know, anti-bigotry movement and minority rights movement, some people in those movements hold bigoted views about Jews and about Israel, so much so that some of them have been driven from their positions. I don't want to mention any specific institution, any specific organization. So in a nutshell, the bigotry from the right would be more from the fringe. Which is not mainstream, so which it doesn't is, really yeah, make no, a big difference. Oh, but the problem is that in order to own Trump, so many people in institutional media elevated those irrelevant small-time clown voices and made them much more relevant and brought so many uh, bad voices out of the backwaters from America into the mainstream, which is a problem. And then the left side, there are more people within institutions that would tweet nasty stuff, will even tell you in your face nasty stuff, where if you were to flip the script and use it against any other minority community, they would, they would go ballistic. So that's, that's a fact. But now in terms of to work with this administration, uh, that administration, um, I think the, the, Biden, the, Biden, the Biden administration is going to be much more of a machine, long time washing in hands. It has upsides and downsides, but that's a whole conversation for a different day. And our next question from Instagram is here. As a private person over here living in Rockland, what could I do to improve relationships and, and I'm assuming this is this is um, a question that every person could have well, you know? what a person can privately do a couple to improve things. relationships with the guy it's, it's, it's very simple if you're on social media follow our accounts and share our articles um, which is OJPAC OJPAC on social media OJPAC or so it's on Twitter on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube we also started recently Instagram we didn't post yet anything there um if you have some funds to send our way, we can use that too. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, just think of yourself as a UPS driver. A UPS driver on the job knows that he wears a uniform where he stands out. Now, it would be unfair for him to be looked at in a certain negative way because a different UPS driver did something crazy. But you try not to be that different UPS driver that did something crazy that can be used and exploited by bigots to paint all of UPS as bad. Know and be aware that you stand out due to your way of life. Standing out doesn't mean it's a pass for people to hate you and pick on you and to generalize. It's just you go out there on the highway on your way home or in the middle of the day, start noticing how white pickup trucks drive erratic. And if you go down that track, Every, you're going to start seeing pickup trucks everywhere and all of them driving like crazy. And just your bias it's playing. It's true, though. It's true, exactly. It's just your bias playing at you. But it doesn't mean that you can't have, that you can't have a tempered moment. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean uh, you know, you're going to give a, you know, a you know, courteous right away to everyone because you wouldn't get home. You know, at some point, you just need to continue driving and let someone else do that charity. Now, if someone's going to, oh, he didn't stop for me. Sir, I stopped already for three different people. You want me to stop for every, to give everyone the courtesy all the time? It's never ending. So, you know, I, I was once at a local utility company and there was a long line. I was in the back of the line. Someone was the second in the line and a person walked in and he, he invited the person to stand in front of him. Between the first ones, he gave, he didn't give him his space. He didn't say, you know what, take my place, I'm going to the back of the line. He, he, put, him, he put him in the front. I was thinking to myself, what, on, on whose cheshbon on whose does he do that? What do you mean? He wants to do something nice. I did my charity already in the morning. I, I, was, I was the post office. I, did it, you know, I helped someone there. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say is don't be hard on yourself if you have a difficult day and you're doing something that any human being can do. Don't think you need to be at the level of 100% people, 100% of the time behave, 100% perfect, or else all bigotry is true. But try to be mindful that as an Orthodox Jewish person, as a person with a couple, with a beard, with a pious, you stand out. Putting on a Yankee cat doesn't, doesn't yeah. help, right? Yeah. It depends. <laughs> Perfect. So first of all, thank you so much, Yossi. I really appreciate it. I, I'm sure that our audience really, really liked it, really enjoyed it. Also, um, Yossi himself has 
39 something thousand followers on, on Twitter. Twitter. That's only after the mass exodus. I was going to ask you why you don't leave Twitter, but okay, I'm not going to. If you have time, we can discuss that too. <laughs> We're ready um, quite a bit over time. I want to give you a huge thank you, Yossi. Let's thank our producer, Moishe Grunfeld. So dedicated. Nothing here would happen without him. Thank you so much, Moishe. Mazel tov on your new house. Moishe just bought a new house this week. So mazel tov to Moishe. See, I know, I know this program is successful. I know it. <laughs> Maybe we should talk and bring you on as our business strategist. All right. If you can afford it, no we'll, problem. We'll talk after the camera's off. Um, and of course... I just bought a house. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my house already three and a half years ago. Um, and a huge thank you once again to Shulam Badansky for hosting our event over here in Perlman Square. Now, one more time. You can follow us on Instagram, the Jewish platform. You can follow our Telegram, the Jewish platform. And... Very soon, to TJP on Telegram. TJP Telegram. TJP Telegram is our Telegram channel, and we are going to start with the WhatsApp statuses, which is probably the most common, very shortly. Thank you all so much for tuning in.